Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. And we're going to continue with the subject matter that we started uh, about a month ago, and last week I told you we're going to talk a little bit about intercession. We're going to talk about prayer, and this has just kind of been a fluid thing, and so uh, please forgive me if we just, I don't want it to drone on or drag on, but I don't want to stop before we talk about what we need to talk about, because prayer, as we learned, is communion with God. It's not a flippant thing. It's not a, a, an occasional thing. It's not a memorization thing. It's not like uh, we have beads and we pray and we memorize prayers. Uh, even the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had their memorized prayers that they prayed. And there's nothing wrong with uh, finding a prayer to pray. You know, some people prayed the serenity prayer or uh, until we figure out how we can engage with God in a more personal note. And as I mentioned last week, I learned to pray by listening to others pray. And so uh, it, it was very interesting. Recently, I was in a church service, and I was watching the man open the service with prayer, and he prayed exactly like his pastor for 30 years had prayed. Not, no shock to me, but it was like, wow, that's a younger version of that man because we learn from those that, are, that we are with. And I would imagine that when I pray, it's a little bit like my dad and it's a little bit like my mom because they were the ones that were closest to me that I learned to pray from. And when I was too little, young to really understand, when we would go to Saturday night prayer meeting, I would engage in prayer because I would listen and at first we would copy and of course you and I enjoy that when we watch our little kids and they play church and they clap their hands and they pray and they baptize and they do all kinds of things. Uh, just hope they don't baptize the cat unless you don't like the cat or you don't mind dressing the wounds of your child. Is that our children, mothers and fathers, we teach them to pray and that is a very important thing. And one of the things that I learned from prayer from those that I listened to is that they did listen to God. There were times where they meditated on Him. We read a few weeks ago from Luke chapter number 11, and I'm going to read just one verse at, at the outset, and then we'll probably land back at this verse. It says, Now it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. And then he goes into what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. So we learned a couple weeks ago that prayer is a two-way street, and we must maintain a constant attitude of prayer. We, in other words, don't go live like the devil and then come do your uh, four hallelujahs and say, okay, God, I'm all right, now let's connect, and I have some needs here tonight. Uh, uh, we could get in that same kind of a thing because we know God will forgive us if we confess our sins and we can get in that route wrote where it's church, our life, church, our life. But God is a part of our life. And so uh, this Christianity thing is not uh, we attend the baseball game, but we're fans. We're diehard fans. We know the stats and all that kind of stuff. And it's very interesting. I was with a friend recently, and I, I said something derogatory about his team because I knew what his team was, and I knew who he was, and I knew it would just light the fire. And boom, bang, and away he went. And you could ask him anything about, he was a baseball player, and in fact, he used to coach the, uh, the Saudi Arabian baseball, national baseball team. He was very good. He'd been recruited by uh, the, uh, the Sox, uh, the White Sox, and then he did not go to play for them because God was calling him to preach. But he's very good. And, but he's a fan, and because he's a fan, he studies it, and he reads it, and he pays attention to it. I know how to go to the game and shout for a little bit, but I, that's about all. And as I was telling the men at... Uh, uh, men's breakfast that uh, I could, if they called me in to play a basketball game, I wouldn't know if I was fouling or what. And so I just want to hog the ball or get it to the guy that could get it in the hoop. And I didn't care who I hurt or who I was in the way of. Now I'm a guy that likes to watch it and I can yell and scream, but I don't know the details. 
And so sometimes we're that way with God. We can yell and scream, but we don't know really what we're doing. And uh, I remember talking to an individual that attended church here for several years, and they said, well, I decided I'm coming, and if I'm going to come to a Pentecostal church, I'm going to act like at a Pentecostal. So he said, I just learned to worship like you guys did and pray like you guys did. He mimicked us, and isn't that what happens with our kids is they mimic us until they learn to talk. And my youngest granddaughter, she'll say, don't it, blah, 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 don't it. And so, you know the subject matter is donut, but it's something about a donut, and so you got to go through it, and the interpretation thereof is. But she's mimicking us, and eventually she'll get there. And she knows some of her colors, and pink, 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 and I was trying to teach her green, and yes, oak green, and that my cup was green, and it was turtle green, and, and her bowl was green, and then she pointed out her pink cup and said, green. I think she got it from the other side of the family. But, <laughs> but she learns from repetition and from that repeating thing and that mimicking thing. And that's what happens in our prayer life sometimes. And it, it grows into maturity. Even when we first begin to speak with other tongues, as we, the Spirit gives utterance, it says, with stammering lips and another tongues will I speak to this people. Some people, it, it, it always is a, a little hesitant or not fluid when they speak with tongues. Some people, they're just like a linguistic. linguistic. You know, they just, boom. It, it erupts, but if you listen to people, and I'm not telling you to criticize one another's prayers, but you'll notice that people have patterns that they pray. Oh, time's up, sorry. Uh, people have patterns that they, <laughs> they pray, and people have ways in which they approach God, and it, you'll notice in your life what works for you, and what works for you may not work for somebody else. So we also read from Paul that we pray with the understanding and we pray with the Spirit. We sing with the understanding. We sing with the Spirit. And we also found out from Romans 8 that when we're praying in the Spirit, we're praying according to the will of God. So if you want a fail-safe way to get what you need, not necessarily what you want, but you need, begin to pray for what you need. And as the Holy Ghost leads you, allow yourself to speak in a heavenly tongue, which what you're doing is you're allowing God to speak through you. So it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? Because God says, you have not because you ask not. Ask and receive that your joy may be full. So we begin to pray and we ask God for certain things. And as we slip into the spirit realm, we, may be, we know the goal, the end result we want from God. But God knows the steps that we need. He knows the things that need to happen in our life, in our heart and spirit. He knows the things that need to happen in others' lives and hearts and spirits. He knows all the pieces on the chessboard. And when we begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, we're praying according to the will of God. And because we're asking, He does it. Even though our understanding is unfruitful. Now, we can go from being our understanding, somewhat knowing what we're praying about, to not having a clue what we're praying about. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it does sometimes. And then I'll find my mind just kind of wandering, and I've been speaking with other tongues, and my mind's not even connected. But that's a biblical thing, because the understanding is unfruitful. And recently, and Sister Maria shared this with me, and I saw it from others that had shared with, they did a study on speaking with other tongues, uh, a group of doctors, because they wanted to know if we were just faking it or uh, uh, how that was working. And they began to under, they said, now, we're, we want you to speak in tongues. And as they would ask people to speak in tongues, they would speak in tongues. But if they would just allow people to pray and begin to speak in tongues, it says their brain activity went down. Isn't that amazing? And it was consistent in the study is the brain activity went down because the, the spirit is understanding, but it, 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 these are matters of the heart that we're working so this is where we enter into the eternal realm. We see eternal things. We see the things that are not as though they already are. We see possibilities. We receive warnings. And we receive hope and courage to live for the day. So I want to talk about John the, the Revelator for just a moment. Uh, it, 
In, jo- in Revelation chapter number one, he begins to pray. And the Bible says, in, I, John, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. There's a lot of tools we can use to get in the Spirit. I have my Bible, and sometimes I read my Bible and then meditate it on it. And this may sound quirky to you. Sometimes I just hold it. Because I say, I'm embracing your word, God, and whatever is in there. And sometimes I begin to quote the scripture and begin to pray. Sometimes I use music. My wife almost always uses music when she prays. She turns on some worship sets. And, and some of them work for me and some of them don't work for me. And, uh, and uh, sometimes it's with words. But most often, you know, I've got uh, some playlists on my phone. Soothing prayer music. Exciting prayer music instrumental prayer music. Why? And it just depends on the day. I might just, uh, I get up in the morning and begin to play those play sets sometimes because I'm conditioning myself to get in the spirit. And once we're in the spirit, that's what I want to talk about tonight is what happens once we're in the spirit. The progression was as John was in the spirit on the Lord's day and then he hears a voice. And it almost seems to happen in quick succession But it doesn't always happen in quick succession for you and I. He hears a voice and he turns around and he sees what we now know to be the resurrected Christ. Now, that must have been quite a shock for him. Remember, he's the guy that doesn't leave the cross when everybody else does. He's the guy at the Last Supper is right next to Jesus. And, you know, the telephone is Peter says, hey, I'm afraid to ask him. So you ask him for me. Is it me? And so this is a guy that when he describes himself multiple times in his Gospels, he he says, and the Lord said to the disciple whom he loved. So, and, and I don't think that is all an egotistical thing that he's saying he doesn't love them, but that's the perception he had of his relationship with Jesus is Jesus loved him. And he was intimate with him. And remember, on several occasions, whether it was in to raise the girl from the dead or the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, there were at least five times where Jesus separated Peter, James, and John, and they went to do something with him, and the others were excluded. They were the inner circle. So this is a guy that really knows who Jesus is, and he, he's praying, and he hears a voice, and I don't know uh, if there's voice recognition. Remember when Mary was in the tomb, and uh, going to the tomb, and, and then she turns around when the, uh, Jesus talks, and she thinks it's the gardener until he says, Mary. Oh. And it all changed because she knew exactly who she was talking to, and everything kind of came into clarity that, oh, go tell Peter and the rest of the disciples, I go before them into Galilee. She wasn't worried that she'd never see him again. She knew that he had promised he'd raise again the third day, and now he has, and now she sees his visage, and she hears his voice again, and she's, I'm going to obey, and she bursts in the room, and hey, Peter, he says to tell you and all the rest of you, he's going to be in Galilee. Is there's a progression and a recognition and maybe John hears the voice and then when he turns around, he sees this and we know that he thinks he's dead. He thinks this is the end because no man has seen God at any time. How, how can we see God and live and really, please don't misunderstand me, this is the resurrected Christ that he has seen. It's not God God's a spirit, right? (laughs) But he's got to appear some way. And first it's a voice, and then it's a visage, and then the conversation begins to be had. And I want you to notice that he begins to talk about John and his relationship with John. And then he says, now to the seven churches of Asia, right? And now it's about God's communication to the church that is present there on earth. Well, Ephesus, Thyatira, Laodicea, Smyrna, and all of those towns that he's talking about, which most of them are in Turkey today, is that there he's saying, yeah, I got a message for the church right now. You need to tell, you need to write to them. And of course, each one of them have a flaw in them, except for Philadelphia. And he says, you, you tell them to repent or I'm going to take my candlestick out of their midst. But then a shift happens and he begins to show him things to come. 
So this spirit trip that we take or spirit world connection that we have, it's a progression. It might deviate slightly, but it's not like we plop down in our easy chair and immediately we're in the spirit on the Lord's Day. Anybody ever had a struggle getting there? Anybody ever had a struggle even getting to the chair to pray? Yeah. It, it has to be a forced habit. I was thinking about this today. Now, I'm, I told you I have these quirks in me that, you know, it used to be when I was a kid, if you turn left, you got to turn right. When you come back out of the room, it's just one of those. I'm maybe a little deficient in some areas. But uh, <laughs> I have always, always, when I approached my vehicles, walked behind the vehicle. Because my dad said, you never walk in front of the vehicle. You walk behind the vehicle. And even before it was a law to have a seatbelt on, I always put my seatbelt on because my dad said, get in, walk behind the vehicle, so you see what's behind you, check out, get in, put your seatbelt on, and I'm, oh, great, seatbelt. But what cued me in is my dad said, hey, it will hold you in the seat better, so when you corner, you'll stay there better. And I'm thinking, ah. <laughs> dad was pretty smart. So it's almost inevitable. I, I lock my vehicle when I leave it. It's just what I've always done. I lock my vehicle. Those are habitual things. And I noticed recently I got a new vehicle. I started walking in front of it. And I thought, now I either need to go back to where I was or I'm giving me myself liberty because now I'm approaching a different vehicle. What happens to you and I before we know God in his fullness, we have a different relationship with him. Now is a new time to have a new approach to God. Maybe it used to be that you was only, only Christmas and Easter. Maybe it used to be you only came to God when you had an apology to make or some forgiveness to ask for. But how about just coming to God and just saying, I love you, our Father in heaven hallowed be thy name. How about just praising him for a while? How about just letting him hear your voice and how great you think he is? That, that could shift. That be, could be a momentum shift in your life, in my life. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to say. First, we got to lift him up. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw him into me, he said about the cross. But we know that he that cometh unto him must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, we're not fooling ourselves, but we are training our mind when we begin to talk about the goodness of God and say, thank you for my home, Lord. Thank you for the vehicle I get to drive. Thank you that uh, you've given me plenty to eat for the wonderful relationships that you've placed in my life and the church and my family. And as I begin to thank him for all of that, it's like a, a spirit of thanksgiving enters into my, my mind and into my being and into my prayers. And so that scripture out of Thessalonians, pray without ceasing and with thanksgiving. If I start with thanksgiving, then my requests get sprinkled with thanksgiving. God, thank you for your great provision for your church. But you know we need a building, so we need a financial miracle. Amen. I know I'm boring too to myself, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> she yawned uh, out loud. <laughs> out loud. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay, everybody get up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As we sprinkle that. So we intentionally do things to get our mind to go a certain way. Have you ever talked to yourself when you're going to, like, you've got to ask the boss for a raise. You're kind of just, okay, it's going to be all right. If he says, no, don't threaten to quit if he doesn't give you a raise because you don't want to be employed. And you got to psych yourself up for that conversation. Well, you prepare yourself mentally and emotionally. So John gets in the spirit. So again, it's about John and that one that's talking. Then it's about John and the current churches. Then it's about the things to come. Write these down because they will happen, John. And man, what a letter he writes. And he begins to write. He said, come up hither and I'll show you things to come. So instead of on in the Isle of Patmos, in the spirit, now he's having a personal conversation with the resurrected Christ on the Isle of Patmos. And he said, hey, come up where I'm living now and I'll, I'll show you what's happening. The things that shall be. 
is the way the translation says it in the King James. The things that shall be. This, this is just the way it is. Now, isn't that amazing that God can show him the things that shall be? God looks through, you know, they're not night vision goggles. But he sits in the realm of eternity, of timelessness. He's the one that defined the boundaries of time. When he set the sun and the moon to govern it, when he separated the night from the day, before that, there was, there was no ticking of the time clock. I mean, there was no batteries in the watch. There was, no, there was nothing. But God set the things in motion that give us reference for time. But one day, it's all going to be gone, right? When we get to heaven, there's no sun, no moon, no stars. For the Lamb is the light thereof. <laughs> Isn't that going to be alert? There is no night, so no stargazing. I, I, I don't get that. But all the things, he's showing him what will be. So in your life, in my life, the only way we can get to that point is with time spent. So it's not just a 12-minute prayer. It's not about the clock of, okay, I'm going to praise, then I'm going to thank, then I'm going to give petition, I'm going to ask forgiveness, I'm going to give forgiveness. And there, that, but it's not about getting to the end of the result. It's not about finishing the goal. It's about getting into the place where he can speak to us about ourself and about what he's doing in the church and about what he's doing in the future. And that's back, uh, Brother Tim, you did great the other night when you spoke to us. You didn't cross any lines at all. Is when he said, when you feel the Lord tell you something's going to happen, stay there till you have the faith to believe it. That's kind of what we're talking about. Because God's going to show us things to come. And we mentioned, oh, now you only have 15 minutes. Just warn you. I don't even know what she's going to say. But Sister Sherry came to me after that service and said, God gave you a dream or a vision years ago. And she said, I see it happening in this church. Can you tell us? Um, yeah, this was probably 30 years ago, maybe. And, um, and sometimes we think, when we have a dream, the next thing that happens, that's it. Or you just totally forget it, which, which I did for a while. But <clears throat> I dreamt that Tim and I were walking out in this field. And across the, the field, we could see this, like, building. And, of course, I was kind of being a smart aleck because I said to him, I go, wow, I wonder if it's some of those. And I don't even know why I thought there'd be people in there. It could have been a shed. It could have been anything with tools. or. But I was, so I said to him, I go, I wonder if in that building they've got s some of those occult people hanging out or, you know, yeah. something like that going on. And so we just kept walking. And so we went in. We were able to open the door. And it was dark, but you could kind of see shadows. And, and there were people in there. And so I said to him, I go, well, it almost is like some of the cartoons when you say something and people get scared. And I said, well, let's, I said very softly, let's just say Jesus. And we did, and they kind of shook. Well, see, in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, this really does work, you know. But, but it wasn't because I was really having compassion. or I, I didn't really know who the people were. I still thought, was thinking, because I couldn't really see their faces. So then I said it a little bit louder, and they shook some more. Well, I'm telling you, it still gives me goosebumps today. I said Jesus to the top of my lungs. The whole place lit up. And this was shortly after Tim's dad had passed away. And his dad was the reason I wanted to serve God because he was, he was such a, a man. He just loved people. And, but, and he had passed away, but he was there. The whole place lit up, and I started looking at these people. And, and I, I can say personally I didn't know him, but I knew him. And I nudged him, and I go, these aren't at all the people I thought, if there were people in here, that this would be. I said, these are some of us. But they have been, you know, out, felt like outcast. They've been hiding. They, you know, and, and 
and Tim's dad just started leading, and everybody just started dancing in the spirit. It was so awesome, and and I and I really see that happening now because you have been praying, and and that's really something we had were concerned about too because there are some people when when you've had the truth, and then some people they just don't go to church anywhere, they just drop off the cliff, you know, and so I just but I. I was so adamant. I said, oh, these are some of us, but it's not like I personally knew them, but I knew them in the spirit. Does that make sense? And I just thought, these, these are our people, and they, they're out here, and there's no shepherd. There's no, but boy, they got so excited, and I mean, everybody just started dancing in the spirit. Well, my first a pastor I had was Brother Leon Brokaw, and I shared that with him, I think, after I had, but then I, we both totally forgot about it, and he's passed away now, but he told me to share that again because it meant, he goes, that was, that was amazing. And I'm just saying, I know that's what's happening here. D does that, okay. is that like a confirmation? Yes. And isn't that amazing that God can plant something in our, thank you, Sister Sherry, plant something in our spirit, and it can lay there latent for decades. And all of a sudden you walk in and say, this is what I saw. You ever been in a place like that? It's like deja vu. It's like, I've been here. And it's like, you know you haven't been there, but you, you feel like you've been there. And that's what's happening in the spirit realm. I, I have a, a, a stack. It's about that thick. And I haven't read through it in years. But when we were very young as a church, and there were maybe eight or ten of us that would be here uh, on a midweek, uh, and the gifts of the spirit would begin to operate. And the gifts of utterance, the gifts of the spirit operate uh, a lot, <laughs> because people come to me and say, somebody was praying with me and said this. They're using the word of the wisdom or the word of knowledge or discerning of spirits, all of that. But the gifts of utterance would happen. And uh, there was a lady that was a part of our assembly. Her name is Mary Much. And uh, she said to me, she said, Pastor, I want to ask permission to do something. And I said, what's that? When there is a gift of utterance, do you mind if I record it on my cassette tape player and then transcribe it? And I'll have copies for everybody the next service. And she probably had a book that thick. And she would do that. And some of you remember that. She'd pass it out. And, 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 and initially I'm thinking, oh, okay, whatever. But what was really cool, she was with us for probably from 1993 until 2007 or something when she got dementia and uh, she moved down with her sister in, uh, maybe it was 2014, in Arizona. And she would come up to me sometimes and she said, Pastor, Pastor, I want you to read that. And it would be a prophecy and it would tell what date it was and what service it was. And she said, it's happening, it's happening. It's happening. And I can't tell you how many dozens of times Sister Mary would bring those prophecies or those transcriptions of the utterances and say, it's happening. And there were things that I had totally forgotten about. So when you pray in the Spirit, when you get in the Spirit, when you feel things, when you see things, when, when God speaks to you however He does, and I had somebody recently tell me, God has never spoken to me in an audible voice, but He stopped me in my tracks and He spoke to my spirit the other day. Some of you have seen angels. Uh, uh, some of you have heard the audible voice of God. Some of you have visions. And some of that has to do with the way we're made up. Some of us are very audible and auditory and, and verbal, and so God talks to us. Some of us, pictures mean a lot to us, and so God shows us things. And, and we may not even fully understand it, but we see it, and then, oh, when Sister Sherry said that two weeks ago, she said, i got to share this because this is what's happening now. God is bringing people. God is bringing those that are wayward. God is bringing those that have known the truth and they're just out there somewhere drifting. I'm so thankful that God is doing a work by His Spirit. But who knows what God is going to speak to you. Then once He does, declare it. Start talking about it. Let's not... Let's not deride one another if somebody says, I had a dream or a vision. Let, share the vision. It's like, they're not the kooky stepsister. You know, that, or maybe I used the wrong terminology, sorry. I don't know. You know, they're, they're not somebody to push back from. God speaks to us. Isn't that amazing? That, 
And they don't have to be life-size and full-grown mature saints. Acts 19. What happened? Have you, have you been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? Oh, had the Holy Ghost? We didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost. They were, they were, they were John's disciples that didn't listen too well. You know, it's just, he that comes after me, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John, John was our pastor. He baptizes them, he lays hands on them, they speak with tongues and prophesy immediately. Why? Because it's the gift of the Spirit. You, God's not going to use you in the gifts because you're perfect. Get over it. And if God loses you in the gifts, you're not perfect. Get over it. It's, it's the fact that we get into the Spirit. We get in that place. We get in that zone. And this is what happens to me. I don't know why. Uh, sometimes when, when God wants to speak by the gifts, I'll know a day ahead of time. Sometimes I'll know it's me God wants to use. Now, I'll just tell you what I have done in the last year or so, uh, because uh, maybe I'm stubborn. There's been rarely in the last couple of years that I've allowed God to speak through me through the gifts of utterance. Because I've been praying God would use you. Because we had several move away and a few pass away that God used. And I said, come on, come on. And God's been, you've been allowing God to speak through you. Thank you for that. I asked God for permission for that. I don't know if he gave it to me, but he's been good anyway. And God can begin to settle in by his spirit. And you just kind of know something's going to happen. Maybe God's going to break in through the gifts of utterance. Maybe God's going to heal somebody. Maybe God's going to answer one of your prayers. But the re how we know that is we regularly practice getting in the Spirit. And so you have to know you. You have to know your tendencies. You have to know what works for you. And then I want to say this, is there can be seasons where it's very difficult. Some of, I, I, somebody told me recently, well, I've never had one of those seasons where I couldn't feel God. Well, you must be better than I am because I have. Oh, yeah. it, you know, or, <laughs> or, or maybe you're more perfect. Maybe it was just, uh, but there's been times where the only place I could feel God is in a church service. For a season, God did that in my life. And, the, and I could come, I could pray, I could fast, I could prepare my sermons, I could prepare my Bible studies, and I'd feel nothing until we get in the house of God and begin to worship Him. And, and then I'd teach or preach, and a half hour later, the afterglow would be gone, and it'd be just as flat as could be. And I went through a season. God was doing something in me. He was trying to get me to say, okay, I'm going to stay in Portland forever. He was trying to shake some things out of, he was trying to say, shake some of my own desires out of me and he did that and it worked. But so there can be times when you're sick and you're saying, oh, I can't reach God. Well, maybe you've been really sick or you're on crazy medication. I'm just talking real to you because uh, know yourself and know what's going on in you. Because, uh, uh, like, I took some steroids recently. Can you tell the extra seven pounds? Now i got to work it off. But uh, you can take that and you can, the side effects of medicine can make you irritable or whatever. Or, or make your emotions go flat or all over the place. And that can impact your prayer life. So... Think about it. If things aren't going the way you thought they should or in the routine or in the progression, stop and think about it. And don't beat yourself up if there's some physiological thing that's causing that. And I've always said, okay, God, if it's me, I need to get me out of the way. And sometimes it's been me. So practice getting into the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And I will tell you this. Sometimes what gets me in the Spirit is trouble. Problems. Trouble in my way. Gotta cry sometimes. <laughs> and pressure in our life sometimes presses us to seek God. I'm thinking about Jacob. He had a, he had a few problems. Just a few. Deceiver had a few problems. And we know the situation that got him 
from his father's house to his uncle's house is that he, he stole the birthright and the blessing through deception, through buying the birthright and through deception he got the blessing. And then, uh, you know, the blessing of the birthright was he gets the land and, and two-thirds of the inheritance. And what does good that does that do you when your brother is going to kill you and you have to run away? It's like, duh. And of course, God had spoken to his mother and said, there's two children in your womb and they're wrestling and the elder is going to serve the younger. And so one started to come out and, you know, <laughs> the first one came out and the other one had a hold of his heel. They called him heel grabber or deceiver. And so I don't know if part of the problem that happened in Jacob's life was because mama tried through carnal means to fulfill spiritual promises. And that's something we got to push back from. It's kind of like saying, God, supply all my need, God. I say, and God says, have you been faithful in your, in your giving? Yeah, I, I put, I've honored you with, okay, I will provide. And then you go to the loan shark. And that really wasn't what God's intention. If you just waited a few more days, you wouldn't have that 32% interest. Okay, I, I, I don't know what's going on in anybody's life, but I'm just saying sometimes we try to make God's will happen through physical means. I can't give anybody the Holy Ghost. I can't force anybody to repent. Now, I have a little bit different role than you, and I preach the word in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and all, with all long-suffering and gentleness. The Bible says instructing those who oppose themselves in a spirit of meekness, per adventure, you'll recover them. But you and I as brothers and sisters, we're to provoke one another to good works. We're to pray for one another. We're to laugh with one another and cry with one another and walk through life and experience life and its ebbs and flows and its ups and downs together. And if we learn how to do that, then we'll be sensitive enough when our brother has a need that we can be the one that supplies the need for our brother. Be prepared that if you ask for God to provide a need, he might just dig into your wallet. Or he might ask for your energy or your abilities. And you're saying, oh, that church needs this. And God's saying, oh, oh uh, that, that church needs remodeling. Well, be careful if you're a carpenter <laughs> or an electrician or a tradesman. God might just say, okay, <laughs> you're right. Pack your bags, baby. You're going over there and it's on your own dime. And God speaks to us. So back to Esau and Jacob. Jacob's gone off on his uh, grand tour at Laban's house, and he spends 20 years away from home, and his father-in-law changes his wages 10 times. Plus, you kind of, you know, I'm glad that I have the father-in-law that I did, and I'm glad that I found the elder daughter. He says, he meets that Rachel at the well, and she's hot. I mean, she's beautiful. <laughs> Goes home, finds daddy, and says, whew, wow. And he begins to work for him, and he says, what can, what can I give you for the wages? And he says, that. And he works for seven years. That's a long time, dudes. Oh, yeah. Ladies, that's a long time. So he waited for seven years and worked really hard. Unfortunately, the morning after the wedding, what a revolting development this is. He wakes up and it's not Rachel, it's Leah. And just so you know, the positive thing that the Bible says about Leah initially was is she had nice eyes. She got married during the pandemic. <laughs> Just. <laughs> so she has nice eyes. But he lives that story, and there's just conflict. Talk about dysfunction. 
and there's competition over who can have male children, etc. And eventually what happens is that he decides, I've had enough, and he heads out toward home with some amount of trepidation. Because remember, he's just, he's ripped off his brother. He's stolen the blessing. And we may think that's a light thing, but remember when his brother came in to get his blessing, Isaac said, sorry, I already gave it. I can't rescind the blessing. This was a spiritual encounter that he had. So he said, I can give you a different blessing, but your brother already has the blessing as the leader of the house. And so Jacob's heading home. And in the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis, we find these words in verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. He, he sets his family in order, and eventually what he does is he, he, puts, he puts a bunch of cattle and all these gifts in the front of the line. He's laid it all out, and then he gets Leah and her kids, or his servants first, Leah and her kids, and he puts Rachel and her kids at the back of the bunch, you know. So there's a buffer if his brother's mad and he takes out, out on his family, he at least has his favorite wife left. It's the truth. He's protecting that. And Benjamin and Joseph were his favorites. There's no doubt about it. And he's ready to meet his brother, but he said, I just can't quite face him. So he crosses over the brook called Japheth, and there he begins to pray. And he literally wrestles with a theophany, which is a manifestation of God. Yeah. Till the break of day. Bless me. Bless me. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. Trouble or extreme circumstances can force us to an encounter with God. When there's trouble in your way, don't curse the trouble. Run to the rock. Run to God. Have a conversation. Have an encounter with him. Maybe that's when you say, I'm going to fast. I'm going to go on a Daniel's fast, and I'm not going to have anything sweet or anything wonderful. I'm just going to, I'm going to eat what I have to to sustain this body, but I'm going to seek the face of the Lord. I'm going to deny my flesh. I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord till I get an answer. Now remember, Jacob's not just a kid anymore. He's probably in his 50s. And he's wrestling all night. And the angel says, let me go for the day breaks. And in verse 26, he says, I will not let you, let you go and you unless you bless me. And he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob, deceiver. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, men and have prevailed. There's something that can happen in a prayer meeting in the midst of our agony and our angst and our trepidation and fear of the future that can bring us to a place of encounter with God that can be life-changing. Now, you're no longer a liar. You're the prince that has power with God and man. That one night of wrestling. But then Jacob says, what's your name? <laughs> well, why are you asking my name? And then the angel left. But I want you to see what Jacob said. Jacob named the place of the, the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. He walked different and he had a different name after he had that encounter with God. It's almost like our baptism. No. I, I'm not it. <laughs> you smart. Huh? Brother Craig's accusing me of imitating him. So, <laughs> but that's what happened. And he didn't despise that. It was all right. I'm different. But I had an encounter with God. And of course, we know 
that he meets Esau. And Esau says, what's all these gifts? Oh, it's there for you. I don't need those. I'll take them anyway. I have plenty. And he fell on his neck and he kissed him and he forgave him. And the counter with God just dissolved all of his obstacles. And he inherited the land. And he had a relationship with his brother. And we know out of his loins came Judah. And out of Judah came the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ. Wow. How can God take such a mess and make it so wonderful? Prayer changes things. Prayer changes you. Prayer changes me. And from then on, it wasn't about what Jacob could get through conniving and, and his own cunning, but it was what God had given to him. And we don't find any other conflicts or any deception in Jacob's life from then on out. Because he had an encounter with God. So as you stand with me, and I don't know if we'll get back into this next week. I'm not sure. But I, I really feel it's important for you and I at this moment in time to say, God, whatever struggle, whatever pressure, whatever conflict, whatever obstacles, it's all right as long as I can connect with you and have your blessing on my life. I believe all of this turmoil that is in our world all of this conflict, and we see it erupted in our in Georgia again this week. I believe it's because there's a battle in the spirit realm. I think what we're seeing on the streets of our world and our nation are reflective of what's happening in the spirit realm. There's a wrestling match. There's a Daniel prayer meeting that needs to be going on where yeah. Daniel says, well, I no, no pleasant meat, no pleasant bread. I'm just going to eat lentils and, and drink water until I get an answer from God. And he began to fast and pray. But God was listening the whole time, and it wasn't until three weeks later the angel shows up and says, well, I'm here. Just so you know, God heard you the first day. Well, why didn't he answer? And he explains what happens. He said, I fought through the prince of Persia and nobody fought with me but your angel. He came to help. And it took us three weeks to beat those spiritual forces. But we did. And here we're here to tell you what is going to happen to your people. And he got a snapshot of thousands of years. Do you need some answers? Maybe it's time to go to your knees and say, okay, God, there's turmoil. All right, God. If I'm seeing this going on, something's going on in the spirit realm. God, open our eyes. So I would challenge you and I to say, God, I'm not asking for trouble. But whatever trouble I see, let it motivate me to go to my knees. And I'm going to learn how to pray in the Spirit like I've never prayed before. We read last week, sometimes it's with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes it's just like, oh, God, I need you. My world needs you. They're lost. They're dying. They're going to hell. I don't have the solutions. I have the gospel, but we don't have the means. Those people, I don't know them. How are they going to come to salvation? And maybe some of what happens also is when Sister Sherry shares her vision and we say, God, if that's what's happening, make us ready to receive that harvest that you prophesied or you showed to her 30 plus years ago. Because remember, God sees the things that are not as though they already are. 
And he lets us see those. Oh God, I pray you would give us a spirit of revelation. That it would come upon us, your children. In this day in which we live, where there is turbulence in our world. There is political and financial turbulence. There is wars and rumors of war. There's havoc in the streets. There's division in every level of government. I pray, oh God, that a spirit of unity would come upon the church of the living God, that you would baptize us with a fresh passion for the things of the Spirit, and that we would be willing to die out to our own flesh and our own longings and our own likes and our own preferences for the sake of the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through us, pray through us. We yield ourselves. Take us into another dimension. Take us into another level of praying in the Spirit, Lord. I ask you to loose that upon this congregation because we will war until there's a breakthrough. We will war until there is revival. Until there is wholesale repentance in our community. We ask this in Jesus' name and we yield ourselves to you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your power and your glory that is in the midst of your people. Thank you for fulfilling all your will we give up to you in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah open yourself to the spirit of God